Welcome to this Jeremy Bamba and White House Farm podcast season four. This episode is part two of the untruthful evidence. In part one, we looked at the lies that the extended family of Jeremy told in order to help his conviction, which was first aired on the 7th of February 2024. And today we are going to look at some of the lies told by some significant police officers in the case. Can't talk about all of their lies because we would just be here literally all day. So we're going to focus on some of the main points. But there are so many that we will be doing a whopping three-part mini-series focusing on the lies told by the police. And I'm joined today by my colleague Yvonne Hartley. Hi Yvonne. Hi Emma. Yeah, if we were to discuss the lies, all the lies of all the police officers involved in Jeremy's case, as you say, it's going to take hours. So we've just selected a few of the key police officers and a few of the key untruths that they were responsible for, which the jury had a right to know were untruths. Perfect. Okay. So it might be an idea to kick off then and start at the very beginning with Police Sergeant Hughes. Police Sergeant Christopher Hughes, yes, he was one of the first officers to arrive at the scene on the 7th of August, accompanied by uh, PC Mail and PC Saxby. Um, PC Saxby remained in the car, and as you probably, most of you will be aware that a recce was done of the house and PS Buser has said multiple times over the years that one or other of them saw movement in the bedroom window, in the main bedroom window. At trial, he put this down with the assistance of the defence, I might add, to being yeah. a shadow, a trick of the light. But I think it's probably important to point out, like you say, his story in pretty much every documentary he's been in has changed in terms of who saw what in the window so in one documentary he said that it was pc mile that first saw this movement um or pointed out the movement and in another he said it was jeremy who first pointed out this movement and then it finally was. in another he said it was him it was who pointed him out the somewhere. movement but in all three and this is a really important point isn't it in all three he says he very quickly realized that it was a trick of the light. So he basically recreated his steps and realised it wasn't a person, it was just the light on the window that looked like it created movement. So he realised straight away that there was nothing to see here. That's right, which then makes it quite difficult to understand why all three of them, or who were ducked behind a hedge, then decided to run to the stationary car, which was parked on Pages Lane, the radio car that Saxby was sat in, and to make a request for firearms assistance for yeah. what he later said was a trick of the light. Uh, he gave a situation report. That situation report has never been disclosed. And now they have the handwritten statements that he said were written by himself and PC Mail that night. We have never mm. seen those statements. They were put on DS Jones's desk, according to uh, Buse, but they have never been disclosed. So those statements probably set out in quite descriptive ways the movement that they saw, but they have never been disclosed. But we do have further evidence now, don't yeah. we, uh, regarding yeah. this issue. Yes, yeah, so yeah. um this is comes in the um form of the New Yorker article that Heidi Blake wrote recently. She interviewed the head of the firearms unit, PS Adams, and he told Heidi that when he got to the scene, he was told that this was a genuine sighting. So absolutely. Why if if PS Buse very quickly realized it was just a trick of the light at, you know in that moment why would he then tell PS Adams that it was a genuine sighting when he got there? Exactly. He 
he would say... And what firearms... I mean, no firearms teams will come out to... If he'd have done that movement to see and realised, oh, no, actually, it's not a person, it's just the way I'm standing, the way I'm looking, then why would he bring the firearms teams out in the first instance? They wouldn't come out to him saying, oh, I think I saw a, a reflection in the window or, or I saw a shadow, or, but, but I might be mistaken. They wouldn't come out. No. Very expensive procedure to send 29 firearms officers to the scene. For a trick of the line. Two, there was 29. So why? It makes no sense. And with Adam's uh, admittance to uh, Heidi Blake, that this was a genuine satin, then, I mean, that just confirms everything that Jeremy has been saying since day one. And I think there's the significance, if people don't realise essentially the gravity of this, it exonerates Jeremy completely because Absolutely. if somebody was alive and active inside White House Farm at that time, whilst he was outside with police, he is entirely innocent Everybody in that house received at least one gunshot injury that would have been immediately or very, very quickly fatal. Nobody could have been alive in that house at that time with Jeremy outside with the police. It's just not possible. He can't be guilty if somebody was alive in that house at that point. So this is, this is you know, it absolutely exonerates Jeremy. So that is why it's so significant to understand whether this really was a trick of the light for a person and uses a proven liar. Exactly. And I mean, there are significantly more factors from the scene on the day that indicate that somebody was alive and active within the house while Jeremy was standing outside with the police. But obviously, we're just going to focus on this one today. We have discussed those other issues of uh, the fact we know somebody was alive in the house on previous podcasts. Yeah. And I think views changed, he's obviously changed his story later, didn't he? So, you know, if we ask the question, well, why would views lie? You know, only views knows why he lied, but you have a, a culture within the police. If there is corruption going on, you you know, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. But it's well also, in the 80s as well. It was, yeah. it was rough in the 80s, wasn't it? Yeah, and he was only a PS, so he would have been under a lot of pressure to cooperate with the um, the investigation in that way. And so, you know, people will say, well, they you know, they've no reason to lie. Well, they do, because it's his livelihood ultimately, isn't it? But uh, yeah. why he has continued the lie quite openly for the last 39 years, only he knows. But, you know, he is a proven liar. You just have to watch the documentaries he's been on to see him changing his story. And now with Adams's corroboration, he, I don't know how he could possibly exactly. get out of that. And we do have on the website, you can watch for yourself, views in two documentaries where he changes the evidence. Uh, we don't have the third one included in that, but there's definitely two in there. It's two there. Yeah, the third one is the Mind House one, isn't it? So they're the yeah, Louis Drew exactly one, um, the Baptist Murder at the Farm. So you, that's when he changes his story yet again yes, to something again. else. So <laughs> it's not as just being mean. It you know it's um it's a fact. So you can see it for yourself that he exactly. just makes it up as he goes along. Exactly. So that's that's PS view. So that's kind of the um the start of it. Okay, so next we have. D.I. Ron Cook, who was the scenes of crime officer at White House Farm. So um, what do we know about him, Yvonne? So, yeah, we'll start with the new evidence, what's in Hardy's article, because the police say, and I've consistently said, that they didn't touch anything at the scene apart from a stool in the kitchen to allow access through to the hallway and the stairs and everything. Every single police officer who's been interviewed or given statements have always denied moving anything. Yeah. But recently, and the, according to the New York article, Heidi Blake interviewed D.S. Davidson. And D.S. Davidson, who was attended the scene, has admitted for the very first time that in the bedroom, D.R. Cook 
picked up the Bible, it was next to Sheila, not on Sheila, but next to Sheila, mm. and thumbed through the pages before it being alerted to him, well, what's going to happen as regards to the crime scene photographs? And he, like, fumbled about and just put the Bible where he thought it was, resting on Sheila's arm. Well, that's not where it was. And we have no. got three other police officers. So we've got Adams, we've got Delgado, and we've got Collins, who were all shown photographs after the trial of the scene for the Dickinson inquiry. And each of them said, well, Sheila's head's not in the place. We remember it. And these are the first three officers into the house. Yeah. This is not hours later. They're the first, among the first three of the firearms teams into the house. So they said Sheila's head wasn't as they remembered it. Her position wasn't as they remembered it. And they remembered that the Bible was 12 to 18 inches away from her at waist high. Yeah. So we've all, obviously, the crowd scene showed a photograph, showed the Bible, which is very blood-stained, leaning up against Sheila's arm. So all throughout, the jury were told the Dickinson Inquiry was told, the um, 2000, the 1991 City London Police Inquiry and the 2002 Appeal were all told, Jeremy had put the Bible there because he staged the scene. Yeah, and I think it's important as well to say that Ainsley assured all three of those officers that the Bible hadn't been moved and that it was in the position that it was always in. So Ainsley specifically said that the Bible had not been moved. Exactly. And a great deal has been done over the years about the significance of the pages that the Bible was found mm. open at. Well, now that's all that time, money, psychologists, experts, is a complete waste of time and effort because we don't know what page the Bible was open on now because we know that Cook yeah. goes through it. And so there's it a likelihood is he found the right, you know, he, he got to the right page again after he just grabbed it, picked it up and started well, I mean, through. I mean, moving it to the position he did, leaning on her arm, made it, it would be impossible if that Bible was on her arm, she couldn't have fed the rifle because you couldn't have moved your arm. It would have fallen over. You couldn't have it there. No. She, so did he put it there on purpose? Or was it just a mistake? We don't know, but we know that Bible was 12 to 18 inches away from her at waist height, which that should have been significant in 1986 when these officers gave their evidence, but it was just after trial and probably they didn't want to go into it. The defence certainly didn't get to know because no. we didn't get those statements or the, the Dickinson statements until 2011. You know, and you don't immediately when you've got multiple thousands and tens of thousands of pages, hundreds of thousands of pages. You don't say, "Oh, we'll just look at Dickinson first. It, it's got to be done strategic, so it takes time. And yeah. so it's only, you know, many years later that we actually started finding this evidence. So, but for that to come out now in the New Yorker article that DSK. It's absolutely shocking because he was blamed for the position of that Bible. And wow. he was in the 2002 appeal, the judge said specifically that that was another string to the prosecution's bow. Exactly. Because the Bible had been placed there after she died, and that was another string to the prosecution's bow. Well, these police officers are, are remaining completely stum, knowing full well that it was Ron Cook that put it there, not Jeremy. But the, these officers were never actually asked at the 2002 appeal if they'd moved the Bible. So because they're not asked... They don't say they're anything. ...they're not known the significance of it with the appeal because they don't obviously involve all the officers in the appeal. They were asked about the telephone. There were 10 firearms officers who were asked about the position of the telephone. None mm. of them officers were asked about the position of the Bible. So we now know that was was moved, by, which totally impacts on the crime scene. So obviously we've spoken before about the position of Neville and the burn marks on his back, which are not, as the jury were told. Now we've got this new information about 
that this Bible was handled by the scenes of crime officer before photographs were taken. Mm. It's not the position as confirmed by three other police officers. And it just undermines the whole conviction because the jury had a right to know. They should have told the jury, well, actually, you know, we didn't think, we picked up the Bible, we put it down, we don't know what page it was on, we, we put it there, I can't remember if that was where we found it or not. They should have been honest should, and told the jury. Exactly, and then it shouldn't have played any part in... Exactly. You know, su suggesting that Jeremy had put it there or that Sheila couldn't have put the Bible wherever it originally was. The prosecution, main, their main sort of thread was that Jeremy staged the scene. Yeah. Jeremy didn't stage the scene at all. It, first of all, we know that there was people alive, at, one, at least one person alive in the house while Jeremy was outside. And then we've got the police interfering with the crime scene. And as the 2002 um, judges said at the appeal, that that was a moral sin yeah. for anybody to interfere in a crime scene. You know, yeah. this evidence has only come to light since the 2002 appeal. And so that is in the submissions and the CCRC have now been made aware of um, Davidson's evidence. So... We'll see what they do with that. And it's it's worth saying, I think, I think we can say this, Heidi's interviews are recorded. So this isn't a case of a journalist. It's not he said. It's not he said, she said. It is all recorded. Her Everything she did was recorded for provenance. And, and then fact-checked afterwards. has been fact-checked by the New Yorker fact-checker. So, you know, it has all been confirmed and clarified. Yeah, so unfortunately it can't just be brushed off as old, oh, you know, media getting something wrong. This is this is a very deep journalistic investigation that oh, I did. Yeah, exactly. So um what else about Cook concerns us around his integrity, shall we say? Well, as you said, he was a senior scenes of crime officer and he is involved in a lot of dodgy dealings with the case because to such an extent that there is a separate submission about malfeasance in public office about Cook which is with the CCRC there's one on Cook and there's one on Ainsley which make yeah. up uh, the, the core joined and they make up one of the issues sent to the CCRC so to discuss everything would take hours yeah. I, I will, we will do a podcast just on Cook and we will do a podcast just on Ainsley in the future and just condense the issues. But one of the major factors was that Cook took the silencer, multiple, yeah. we say, to Sandridge on the 15th of August to have fingerprint testing done. So this is in a, a, a chamber where they use super glue fumes to stick yeah. and they know that they can extract fingerprints. So that was on the 15th of August. He said in evidence continually that he there is the chain of evidence for the silencers is appalling. This yeah. same age, there is no continuity with the chain of evidence. So Cook would he didn't sign the silencers out, he didn't sign them back in, it just sort of appeared that it been to Sandridge and done fingerprints without any continuity documents being signed. But we, we now know that on the 15th of August, he took silences to Sandridge to be fingerprint tested. He then went back on the 23rd of September to do more testing. But we have the evidence on a special form called the PY10. Now, that PY10 is Sandridge's record of what happened while the silences were there. Yeah. And on the 21st of August, it's documented that photographs, multiple, were taken of the silences. Now, yeah. if Cook had them still in his possession from the 15th to the 23rd and didn't leave them at Sandridge as he stated he didn't leave them, how can they photograph them on the 21st? Now, another major thing is that those photographs have never been disclosed. So we want those disclosed and we have asked the CCRC to get them done. But there's another anomaly because Cook tested the rifle for fingerprints and says that he found two 
one belonging to Sheila and one belonging to Jeremy. Mm. Now, the date of the document that he states he found this, these fingerprints is dated the 11th of September. Yeah. But Jeremy's fingerprints were not taken till the 23rd of October by D.S. Davidson. That's yeah. documented, it's on record, and Cook even confirms in a statement that he received the Jeremy's fingerprints on the 23rd of October. So how on earth can he identify Absolutely. Jeremy's fingerprint on the 11th of September? It's just... Now, my theory, I do have a theory on this, is that on the 11th of September, Jeremy was still being questioned. He was still in custody. He was arrested initially on the 8th of September yeah. and released without charge on the 13th. The police had absolutely nothing on Jeremy. They even had blood evidence at that time. The DPP wouldn't charge. So was this fingerprint, like, oh, let's say Jeremy's fingerprints on it, because they needed something else to push the DPP over the line in order to charge Jeremy? Yeah. We don't know. But, I mean, isn't it weird? How can you identify a fingerprint? Weeks and before you, you and you've got it. Well, you can't. You can't. You, can't. It's, you know, it's falsified documentation one way or the other, isn't it? Well, there's multitude yeah. examples of how Cook has manipulated evidence, how he's changed exhibit reference numbers, how he has actually provably lied and been untruthful. Like I say, we have set all that out to the CCRC in a malfeasance in public office document that um, we will do a podcast about. Uh, his issues. Yeah, uh, I think it's on, on, on one occasion he's questioned about something when he says about changing a a number. Well, I inexplicably put the wrong number on. I don't know how I managed. Yeah, he, put the wrong, he put his wrong initials down. Why would you put your wrong? In, you don't put your wrong initials down. Oh God! You don't it's... Put each to, to people who don't know. So um, to explain, when a police officer puts an exhibit in, they use their initials. So and then a number for each item that such so just a continual number at one two three four continue. Yeah. So so if Emma put an exhibit in, it'd be EM one, EM two. If I put yeah. one in, the YH one. But he changes his. It's like what? Do you not even know what your name is anymore? It's ridiculous. So like yeah. I said we do have a lot of further examples of Cook, and we will focus on them in the near future. I think Davidson says in the article that oh, you know, he then oh, spent the rest of the I'm very sorry, but there is something else major what Cook did, what we can reveal, that we have for years and years pushed the CPS, pushed the Essex Police and pushed the CCRC to obtain very specific documents. We even went to a judicial review for 27 specific documents, what they wouldn't disclose to us. So these photographs is everything. But we have the evidence that Chris Mersker, who was responsible for the RTV drama White House Farm, met D.I. Cook in a pub in Essex and he gave him files of documents. Caroline Lee, the author whose book the drama was based on, was also provided documents which she posted photographs of on her Instagram page. So why are they providing documents to a member of the public? He denied denied that under questioning as well, didn't he? He He denied denied it, but the the fact of the matter is, uh, unfortunately for us, it's police. Miss Lee posted photographs of these documents on her Instagram page and we were quick enough to get copies of those photographs off the Instagram page and the home's box reference numbers are there on them. So we know, and and on some instances, there are documents that we were requesting. So it's not a question of whether he lied, um, because he did lie, but the question is, why did he try and cover up the fact that he Why did he have the documents? Why do you have it in the first place? Yeah, but um, the fact that he 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 knew he was doing something wrong. Because otherwise, well, isn't that? And I mean, those maybe this is why six police haven't got the documents because maybe they took them home. We don't know. 
we know that Ainsley took them home because he admitted that he took yeah, documents home and gave them. Yeah, and in the case of why the eye cook would lie, again, only he knew, and he's dead now, isn't he? But only he knew why he lied. But ultimately, the evidence shows that he absolutely did. Davidson in the article talks about he then spent the rest of the case, I think, you know, trying to cover up the mess he'd made. And, you know, but unfortunately, it just compounded and compounded. And when you actually get the evidence in the chain of events, it yeah. shows that, you know, so many holes and evidence of continually trying to cover things up, like turning two reference numbers into one reference number and, and that type of thing. But you then have... Turning two silences into one silence. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to leave it there for now, but please join us for part two of this Liars mini-series where we will be discussing the lies and corruption of officers B.S. Stanley Brian Jones and D.I. Robert Miller. Join us then. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you'd like to do something to help Jeremy Bamba, then sign our online petition to the Home Secretary for the disclosure of case documents that are still withheld by Essex Police. Visit www.change.org and search for Jeremy Bamba. Don't forget to share the link with your friends and family. Mm-hmm.